On behalf of the FCC, I would like to welcome you all here today. Uh, my name is Wing Chow. I'm a journalist governor on the FCC board, and I still hope to be a week from today. Um, so, uh, before we get, st uh, as the uh, co-convener of uh, the finance committee, it's very gratifying to see a full house here. So, we thank you very much for that. Um, before we get started, just a usual quick reminder to uh, turn off your mobile phones and uh, a few quick announcements. Uh, we have the several upcoming uh, lunches. Um, on the 18th, we have uh, Professor Michael de Goyer talking about the making of modern Hong Kong from apathy to Occupy Central. On the 20th, uh, Thomas Easter, Sailing Through Troubled Waters, a film about the disputed Spratly Islands. And on the 21st, Professor Charlie Jeffrey is uh, talking about Britain after the most unpredictable election in living memory. So what next? Okay, uh, on to today's program. Uh, to a lot of you who were here last year when uh, Bill Michaels spoke on Edward Snowden and Julian Assange, he's no stranger. Um, Bill is a former top covert operative who survived an adventurous and successful career working variously with the RCMP in Canada, the FBI, DEA, Homeland Security, and so on in undercover capacities investigating terrorism, drugs, homicides, and money laundering. He once had a standing $100,000 U.S. bounty on his head after successfully infiltrating the Colombian cocaine cartel. Bill started his professional career as a Eurobond trader in London before joining the RCMP in the mid-80s. His career has seen him covertly working as a futures and options trader and engaging in all manner of financial crime, which gave him credibility as he negotiated money laundering transactions with a significant number of criminal and terrorist entities. Uh, he is recognized as an expert on sophisticated money laundering by the U.S. Federal Court and in senior courts in Canada including the role of lawyers and third-party professionals in facilitating global money laundering operations. Uh, Bill, who is a Canadian, uh, now resides in Hong Kong, where he does investment banking and advisory on anti-money laundering and financial crime risks. He will also serve as an advisor to the first-of-its-kind executive hedge fund program in Hong Kong and Asia, to help build the expertise of the next generation of hedge fund managers and counterparties through the collaboration of the Hini Business School and the International Capital Markets Association. And with that long-winded introduction, uh, I give you Bill Miker. Good afternoon, and, and again, Wing, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity for a second time to be able to speak to the FCC and, and its members. Um, obviously, what I'm going to talk about today is, is my perspective on, on money laundering and, to a lesser degree, financial crime uh, in Hong Kong. And, and again, if I've missed anything on money laundering, I, I see that there's a number of lawyers, bankers, and accountants here. So again, if I've missed anything out of professional courtesy, feel free to fill in the gaps. Um, one of the things I, I, I like to start out by saying is I, I want you just to think of one word. Can you think of one word that best describes the separation between an honest uh, banker and a dishonest banker? And it doesn't have to be a banker, an honest person and a dishonest person. The one word that comes to mind for me is opportunity. And in the absence of opportunity, not too much happens. But right now in, in Asia, particularly in Hong Kong, it's a target-rich environment. Uh, you know, when you've got this, this giant elephant called China at your door with so much money looking to move out and, and looking to come back in. 
what I'm going to talk about is uh, I'm going to relate some of the money laundering experiences that I've had where I've negotiated either to launder money or have money laundered for me through specific uh, types of transactions. And then I'm just going to uh, relate them to what I see in Hong Kong because the, the methods uh, typically of laundering money, uh, methods of doing financial crime, they haven't changed in, in hundreds of years. Uh, you know, we have modern features uh, that, that give it a modern edge, but it's always the same core elements, so it, it hasn't really changed. Uh, before we begin, what I'd li like to do is just very quickly establish what money laundering is and, and some of this, the basic terminology. You know, there's confusion about money laundering, but, but typically 99% of the methods used to launder money are perfectly legitimate, legal, proper, commercial uh, ways of, of doing business. It's really the source of the funds that is the issue for us. You know, there's, there's much discussion about, uh, especially now, about how much money is leaving China. But, you know, again, let's differentiate between dirty money, and dirty money is money that is uh, created through the uh, results of criminal enterprise. Could be drug trafficking, weapons trafficking, but very specific criminal offenses. Then, then you have, uh, you know, gray money or black money, which is not necessarily criminally derived, but it's been misappropriated, uh, and, and it's moved out. So a lot of people uh, talk about uh, the parallel banking or the unofficial banking system as, as really being money laundering. Yes, it's violation of Chinese uh, currency controls, but in the classic sense of how we understand criminal money laundering, it, it doesn't really fall into that same category. Typically, there's, there's three ways that uh, money is laundered. Uh, the first way is, is through the physical delivery of cash. And, and, you know, cash is bulky. Again, when you're dealing with, with real criminals like drug traffickers, they don't deal with checks, they deal in a cash-based business. But one of the issues with China is, you know, cash is heavy. The biggest note in China is the $100 or 100 renminbi. It's only about $13 US. And to give you a point of comparison, you know, a, a pound of cocaine used to generate, in, in street currency, in street currency being fives, tens, and $20 bills, a pound of cocaine would generate three pounds of weight in currency. A pound of heroin would generate 12 pounds of weight. And you hear this talk about, you know, a million dollars. A million dollars in $20 bills weighs over 100 pounds. So you, you get an idea that the physical movement of, of money, while it sometimes goes on and, and by necessity goes on, it's not very efficient for moving the vast sums that we've seen coming out of China, which in for many calculations exceed well over a trillion dollars. The second way that money is really moved is uh, through the financial system. You know, letters of credit, uh, wire transfers, uh, et cetera. Now, the banks are, are heavily regulated. Uh, there's all sorts of oversight, and especially now, uh, controls. So while a great uh, amount of money that's made its way into the system is mu moving through the financial system, that is still not the largest way by which money uh, illegally or illicitly is moving around. And the third, and by far the, the greatest uh, movement of money is through the physical movement of goods, you know, trade, trade finance, or, and, and, you know, trade-based. And again, Hong Kong is at the portal of the world's biggest, uh, you know, factory, which is China. So the amount of goods that are moving back and forth, it is, it is not a surprise that so much money is going through fictitious trade, uh, bogus trade, uh, you know, phantom invoicing, et cetera. And, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. I think before we get into, I'll share my observations of, of, of Hong Kong. Um, I don't think that you can talk about Hong Kong in isolation. You, know, you can't ignore uh, who China is because so much of what is happening in China is dictating what, what is happening in Hong Kong and what is flowing through Hong Kong. I think it's important to understand that you know, China has uniquely uh, has a system of government. Before it was the imperial system, and, and today you now have the, the Communist Party of, of China that is uh, running the show. You know, for the Chinese government, they have known for, for decades, in fact, we've known for hundreds of years about the Chinese underground banking system. Uh, you know, there's a lot of distrust within the Chinese system after the Cultural Revolution, etc. There's only one bank up until 1978, which was the People's Bank. So for people to do commerce, and, and to get things done in China, they had to go to the underground banking system, uh, you know, to deal with the ineffectiveness of the bureaucracies. So it's very uh, well understood by the government that this entire underground banking system is thriving. It's effectively institutionalized. But for the Chinese government, the, the issue is not about the law. The issue is about political and social stability. So it serves a policy agenda for a lot of these uh, flows to be occurring, to be going on. 
It's only at the point when they start zeroing in on individuals, it's because those individuals have been identified as to potentially being a, th a threat to the political or, or social stability of uh, China, and that's why you, you have these issues. The, uh, I would say, based on what I see in my experience, the, the Chinese model of money laundering is, is quite unique to China. It's really not a threat to the rest of the world. Contrary to, to uh, you know, much in modern media about how China's distorting things, you know, m organized crime and others from other parts of the world, they don't really launder their money through the, the Chinese system. And, and just as a, a quick point of comparison, you look at, at uh, you know, Russian, uh, for example, when, when Russian gangsters have taken their billions of dollars out of Russia, they make sure it never goes back. And the thing about being Russian, for example, is they're Caucasian. They can fit in, they can walk the streets of New York, walk the streets of Paris. Uh, they, being Caucasian and, and European, they very quickly engage with other criminal organizations in different parts of the world. But the Chinese experience typically is they keep roots in China. They, you know, typically when Chinese leave, they go to only uh, major centers such as uh, London, Vancouver, Melbourne, San Francisco, and even then they stay within uh, Chinatown, and they don't really have the same degree of mingling with organized crime or others around the world. And, and one of the interesting things about uh, the Chinese uh, capital flows through, chi uh, through Hong Kong or elsewhere is just as it's important for the money getting out, there's an equal amount of money looking to get back into China. And that's one of the major concerns of the Chinese government is this hot money that's coming back in and it's fueling these little pockets of inflation, especially, especially in second and third tier cities. And the government is very focused on that, again, because of the issue of, of political and social instability. Now, having, having said all that, I'm going to use a bit of Canada as a comparison because that's where I come from. And, and I definitely have uh, you know, hands-on experience about understanding one simple thing. Money is the greatest coward on earth. You know, money, like water, uh, looks for the path of least resistance in which to flow. I can be very critical of Canada, and, and again, you'll understand what I call basically a, a, a legal arbitrage. In Canada today, a, a very good friend of mine was just speaking last week and, and identified Vancouver as a global money laundering hub, and that story's been picked up across the media in Canada. And the fact is, Canada is truly a, uh, a, a back door uh, in many ways for global organized crime and terrorist groups. Why? Because they created certain conditions in Canada and as I say, money's a coward. It, takes, it goes where there's less risk and follows the path of least resistance. And in Canada we have stable banking laws, uh, stable banks, stable trust laws, we have st very strong privacy act, uh, we have the United States which is a huge market, uh, you know, right at our border in the same time zones generally. And, and, but more importantly, you have uh, very weak criminal enforcement laws. And you have, uniquely in Canada, lawyers are statutorily exempt under our Constitution from even reporting uh, <coughs> suspicious cash transaction reporting because it's a violation of solicitor client privilege. These have created the perfect storm. You look today in, in China, the 100 most wanted uh, criminals by the, by the Central Commission on Discipline, 26 or 27 of them have fled to Canada. Again, what do they know that the, that the rest of the world doesn't already know? So against that context, I'm just going to share with you my observations based on what I've, I've done for the last 30 years. And I've been living now in, in Hong Kong for the better part of seven, eight years. And in that time, I've been involved in, in banking transactions, asset management, done lots of uh, representing outbound capital from China, uh, mostly for SOEs. So in that process, you hear, you learn, you see a lot, and you can start connecting dots because what should be done in a normal commercial circumstance sometimes doesn't define uh, how some of the Chinese companies are doing business. And, and so it is not a, uh, this is not hyperbole. Hong Kong is definitely the money laundering hub of Asia. Uh, there is no other city in Asia that has the capital flows uh, illicitly uh, flowing through, uh, like in Hong Kong. And, and again, I go back to the path of least resistance. Now in, in Hong Kong, I look, you know, in Canada, we signed on to the FATF guidelines on money laundering as a, as a specific offense back in the late 80s. Most of the G10, uh, G20 countries have all been following and have ha enacted specific money laundering legislation for well over 15, 20 years. Hong Kong only brought in a money laundering ordinance in 2012. And, and so in the absence of that, uh, they didn't even have any, any uh, requirement to do record keeping. There was no statutory requirement on disclosure. You know, you can, you can 
ask yourself, was that by design or by happenstance that, that this whole thing happened? So you got mandatory reporting, which is lax. Most of us come, I, I assume, from Western-style countries, and let me ask you, every time you go across a border somewhere, besides putting down and filling out the card about who you are, there's also another question that's asked, and it's never asked in Hong Kong in any document, are you bringing in more than $10,000, either in cash or any other form? You know, Hong Kong is conspicuously absent from having that kind of reporting. I can come through with, with wheelbarrows of cash, not a problem. There's a reason why Hong Kong is, is Asia's laundromat. It says, we don't ask you questions about where your money's coming from when you come across our borders. You know, I look at this, I talk about proportionality. And, you know, the way the, the my understanding of, of how the ordinance reads is a financial institution that is found uh, guilty of facilitating money laundering, they face up to two years in jail and up to a million Hong Kong dollar fine. Now, if I'm a little old lady and I'm taking five cans of powdered milk across the border, guess what my penalty is? Up to two years in jail and $500,000 fine. So what do you think I want to do? Do I want to move five cans of milk or do I want to move $50 million across and maybe make 100,000 US and I don't mind paying my, my million dollar Hong Kong fine? So again, all these ripe conditions uh, are being exploited. The other thing in Hong Kong that's uh, somewhat unique against most developed uh, uh, financial centers is that they don't have any civil forfeiture laws. So, you know, before 2012, for you to be able to convict somebody for money laundering, it had to be tied into what they call a, a predicate or underlying offense, meaning you were, you were investigated for drug trafficking, we seized your drugs, here's the money, the proceeds of crime, and so then you charge it. To combat, to combat all this other money laundering uh, that happens, because there's a lot of financial crime that occurs. I mean, we use drugs because it's such a simple analogy. But with these other crimes, um, you know, how does somebody who, who hasn't been working for years uh, afford what they have? And so, you know, they, they had the ability until recently to be able to, to accuse people of money laundering. But now in Hong Kong, you had the, the Court of Final Appeal just recently saying that you know, you can no longer convict anybody from money laundering unless you can prove that they knowingly laundered the proceeds of crime. Let me tell you the problem with that. You know, knowingly means, from the police point of view, that you need to either do an undercover operation where you're telling the accused, these are the proceeds of drug sales or these are the proceeds of a specific offense, or you have to do wiretaps so you can hear and hope that a conversation takes place. Both those investigative techniques take up a lot of time, take up a lot of money, and it's very hit or miss. So again, uh, Hong Kong uh, you know, doesn't have civil forfeiture. There, there's no way to, to do a reverse onus on, on people. And, and the other thing that has always boggled my mind, and I'm gonna get into this a, a little further, and, and I ask this every time I speak, especially to bankers, accountants, and lawyers, and, and it deals with the public markets. It deals with you know, licenses. You know, Hong Kong uh, marketplace is considered the sixth largest market in the world. So, you know, New York and London uh, are obviously the, the larger ones, but nobody's paying them uh, 50 to 60 million US dollars to get a backdoor listing just for the consideration on the listing. You know, in fact, they, they don't really do it. You just look at the value of the company. But for some reason, you know, and primarily it's Chinese companies, 95, 97%, all saying, you know what, I really, we go to the public markets for two reasons, to raise money, to expand your company and your product line, or as an exit. Uh, to the public market because you built the business. But here in Hong Kong, people are, are wondering, hey, I want to go, I'm willing to pay for, for either a gem board or, or a listing, gobs of money that never gets uh, disclosed or reported anywhere because you have to pay the consideration for the listing. The vehicles, listed companies to some degree in Hong Kong are nothing more than vehicles. They're not there to really drive uh, the public company. It's there to provide a conduit and a vehicle. You're looking at at a number, you know, one, four, six, or nine, doesn't matter uh, the licenses. I mean, it's ungodly the amount of money that people are paying for the licenses. It's almost impossible to recover what you've paid in those kind of fees from doing normal commercial operations in a broker dealer in Hong Kong, you know, especially on a smaller scale. But people are spending hundreds of millions of dollars from China to buy these uh, licenses or these listings. And again, I'll come back to that a bit. But again, Hong Kong is the only place in the world where you have this uh, trade and, and such valuable trade. And again, for me, it's nothing more than, than acquiring vehicles. The other thing that is unique about Hong Kong, and again, it's not a criticism 
uh, of the setup, but it creates some of the conditions that, again, are unique to Hong Kong. You know, Hong Kong has no central bank. The, the closest thing to a central bank, you know, in England you have Bank of England, Bank of Canada, etc. But the closest thing we have here in Hong Kong is the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. Now, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, you know, the finance secretary ultimately uh, is in charge of it. Now, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, it is the primary regulator and watchdog over all banks and other cash businesses, remittance businesses, etc. in Hong Kong. Now, the problem with this is that the you know, the Hong Kong uh, Monetary Authority both regulates, but it also partners uh, with the banks. And, and the example I use is, the, you know, Hong Kong Interbank Clearing Limited is a private company that's a joint venture between the HKMA and the Hong Kong Association of Banks. So all banks are members of the HKAB. And so, you know, they use that to, uh, to do all the settlement for, for Forex, all the clearance for, for currency that's running through Hong Kong. And then they also, together, through that private entity, run what's called the CMU, or the Central Money Market Unit, which is really the settlement system for, for the movement of, of securities through Hong Kong. But in all cases, those all are profit centers. The, you know, people don't do these transactions for free. And so my only observation is the, the chief regulatory body also has the perception, at least, of having a, a business enterprise with the very people they're supposed to regulate. And all I know, based on my 30 years of, of being involved uh, in both capital markets and in policing is that you get, you tend to get uh, more objective uh, oversight if somebody is truly third party and independent of, of the process. Um, in Hong Kong, I, you notice the, uh, a fellow by the name of Liu Jun Cheng, I'm not sure I'm saying his name right, but he was a 22 year old dropout uh, from Guangzhou. And in a period of time in, in 2009, 2010, this fellow, 22-year-old high school dropout, he laundered, uh, I think, let me get the number correct, uh, 13 billion, 13 billion dollars uh, via Chi Young Bank. He was driving across every day the border and dropping off 50 million dollars. Now, Chi Young Bank, you know, subsidiary, I, I understand, of Bank of China, but, you know, their only, their total deposits were only, for, in Hong Kong, were only 30 billion dollars. How does a guy come across, do 4,600 uh, transactions and then a, a further 3,500 transfers and that doesn't trigger any alarms. Um, this went on for, for over eight months and I don't know how the police finally got to the point where they investigated it but it's rumored that there was a, there was a tip off. But how is it that, that the banks, the bankers in this day and age, uh, the oversight, how do they miss something like that? And then you, uh, you know, to put it in comparison, the budget for Hong Kong's welfare or the dole is about 13 billion dollars. This guy laundered the exact same amount, and, and it didn't raise any flags. So again, it makes me curious. And then you have this woman, Lei Ming Ling. You know, she was uh, an elderly, illiterate person from an impoverished village uh, on the border. And over a three-year period, she, uh, she brought in uh, to about six different banks in, in Hong Kong uh, in excess of uh, $6.8 billion. She made over 4,800 deposits. Uh, I'm sorry, much more than that. She made tens of thousands of dollars uh, of interactions, illiterate, impoverished, uh, from, from nowhere. And that never triggered any, any alarms anywhere in Hong Kong. Uh, what happened is, is a years after the fact, a few years after the fact, uh, some Dutch citizens were victims of a fraud and they made a complaint to the Hong Kong police and one of the accounts used was the very account that she had been laundering the money in for organized crime out of China. And so that was the only reason. And she gets a 10 year jail sentence. This illiterate woman gets a 10-year jail sentence, but nobody from the banking establishment or the professional community uh, lost one dollar and spent one day in jail. So the, again, there, there's a lack of proportionality when I look at Hong Kong as to uh, who they're targeting, who seems to get away with it, and, and who doesn't. I talked earlier about uh, you know trade-based uh, money laundering, and that is by far uh, the most active way that, that money is moving. Uh, back in uh, the early 90s. I, I uh, met with uh, the Colombian cartel, and they were laundering their money, a lot of the, the money at, at least, through commodity transactions. And, and basically, uh, what they were doing is they were selling the drugs in North America. Four minutes left? Okay, I'll speed it up. Um, I, okay, I probably won't get into the detail, but anyways, trade-based uh, money laundering, it's, it's easy to do through the uh, manipulation of, of invoices. If I'm going to ship uh, two million tons of 
grade A coal. Um, really, I'm paying for grade A coal uh, somewhere in the world, so money comes out of China. But what I'm really bringing back is grade C coal. I've actually only played about one quarter of what it shows on the manifest. And who in the customs duty knows the difference between grade A coal or, or grade C coal? I mean, I certainly don't. I'm sure they do, but, but that's how so much money is moving here. And, and again, the logistics, shippers, there's all sorts of red flags on, on which you can, uh, you can catch some of this stuff. Um, the other thing uh, we hear a lot of talk about is the, uh, the free trade zones in, in Shanghai and, and elsewhere. These free trade zones uh, are, are a great conduit for, for doing uh, what's called collateralized loans. And so people are wondering, how is it that all these uh, Chinese are buying houses in Vancouver and London and elsewhere? Well, what they're doing, it's not hard to set up bank accounts. I can go into China as a foreigner and I can set up multiple bank accounts. I can do uh, 2 million US a day or 15 million renminbi a day and just uh, open up the account, shut it the next day and move the money around. And in, and in Hong Kong, I'm sorry, in China, it's not difficult for an army of, of people to be going around opening up accounts on behalf of people involved in parallel trading or elsewhere. And again, what I come back to earlier, the Chinese police don't investigate all these uh, type of transactions unless there's a, a political reason to do so, meaning are you, are you a corruption threat in terms of political or social instability? Other than that, it's free game. So what happens is, you know, there's all sorts of counterparty risk in Western banks and institutions because uh, I show up, I'm a Chinese fellow, I show up in, in London, I want to do $50 million to buy this business. Um, you know, the local bank in Britain says, well, what do you have for collateral? I've got one of the major Chinese banks in the free trade zones saying, look, at, we'll collateralize that loan. We, we're holding on money here in the, in the bank in China. You can release money to him in London so he can go do his business. There's no way that the counterparty bank knows whether that's a government official, a politically exposed person, or really what the source of that money is. Because it's quite easy to get it into the system there. And that's one of the ways that a lot of money is, is going out through foreign mortgages and loan services through these type of collateralization. The point I was just, uh, I know we're in time, but I think it's important to talk about uh, the use of public markets in, in Hong Kong. I have never seen a public market anywhere in the world that has the same degree of, of cross holdings and BVIs uh, as a market shareholder base. And I go back to earlier, you know, why would a major company in China, why would they want to do a backdoor listing? Why wouldn't they want to do an IPO to really announce, hey, here's who we are, we're making X amount of money, we're going to be generating this much more in profits on, on, our, on our pro formas. The reason they don't want to do that is because they haven't been paying their taxes for years. And, and if they go through an IPO, they've got to disclose as they're taking the asset out, what is the fair value of those assets. So instead, they arrange to, to do a backdoor listing. So what happens is they, they use the valuation company to make that billion dollar asset really only 100 million. Whether they're paying them off or not, I don't know, but they all want repeat business. So a billion dollar asset is moved out of China for 100 million. It's, it's getting vended into a, a listed company here in Hong Kong. That listed company then goes to do a secondary financing. And now, lo and behold, the real value of the company starts to, to show up. And, and the thinking is, well, the Chinese government, if they come to me, hey, what can I do about it? The market you know, is saying that this is what it's worth and this is how I came in uh, to be dealing with it. But the thing that really uh, triggers in my mind a, a whole bunch of concern is when you go and you take control of one of these listed companies, the owner of that listed company says, okay, I own 60 or 70 percent, maybe not directly in my name, but I've got all these BVIs, I've got all these related people, and I can deliver to you, uh, Mr. China, uh, business owner, control of this public company, but why am I giving it to you for free? The intrinsic value today uh, of a main board shell uh, if for 100 percent value is roughly 500 million Hong Kong dollars, give or take. I mean, there's a real market for this. But let me ask you, you know, and I ask this of every banker, accountant, and lawyer, where in the financial statements on any transaction is it ever reflected where that consideration was provided? Now, some of it you can write off to goodwill, but there's a lot of these public companies that are barely trickling along. They're not worth 50 million US for consideration. So if you're able to fudge the valuations and have a, no shortage of professional bodies all working together to make sure you don't trigger the takeover rules and, and all the rest in the public markets, how much money is being laundered by, by a misvaluation? Of, of assets that are moving in and out, and the public market is a perfect foil for that. Then, you know, how hard is it again? I come back to this about vehicles, Hong Kong, why people are willing to pay such a premium for vehicles. You know, 
I'm in, I'm in China. I own a, not in my own name directly, but I control a public vehicle or an entity in Hong Kong. I'm sitting here in China. I don't care, let's assume it's a public company. It's easy to manipulate the stock. I can do a CB. It's a tightly held control stock. I want to move money across. I just, uh, you know, enter into a convertible bond. Okay. And, and simply all I do is manipulate the price. So then I convert the bond into, uh, into the value in Hong Kong and I've effectively moved a lot of money over. I've simplified it in the interest of time. But, but anyways, uh, one last thing I'll, I'll say is, uh, you know, we all look about uh, at Macau. And for sure that you know they're they're cracking down and appropriately cracking down. But Macau, the 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 depth and degree of illicit capital flows in Macau is far greater than whatever's recorded. I've said this uh, just again based on my observations. There are legitimate junket operators, I'm sure, but to me, uh, the public face of organized crime in this part of the world is junket operators. They they operate. They don't, when, you know, they have all these rich clients from China, they make sure that they have more than their 50,000 limit to get it out of China so they can gamble in, in the casinos. They're operating a lot of the VIP rooms. And, and so what happens is, uh, you know, they, they know where to go collect the money if somebody hasn't paid it. But more importantly, what happens, and this is where it gets more insidious, you know, I go into a, I go into a licensed financial institution in Macau or, or elsewhere, and I said, look at, I want to open a margin account. I want to be able to trade stocks or securities. And they said, look at, we can only give you this much leverage or you don't really qualify. So the guy says, okay, I guess I'm gonna walk out of here. But the banker says, hold on, I know these guys who are the, you know, these junket operators who have loads of cash, they're willing to give you up to 20 times leverage. And once they, once, you know, basically it's a form of loan sharking. Okay, here's the money, you go out and you trade. And, and one last thing on this. You know, you hear all this talk today, you know, gambling is illegal in China, right? That's why they all go to Macau. And there's a whole bunch of interesting statistics on Macau. I just don't have time to give it to you. But, the, uh, but in, in, in China, because gambling is legal, illegal, you, you notice all these commodity exchanges opening up, you know, precious metals exchanges, oil and gas exchanges. And, and if you go into China, you'll notice that, you know, some of these commodity exchanges have well over a thousand outlets scattered across China. It's just like a bookie. Right? You know, is gold going to go up or it's going to go down? It's a game of high-low. And again, these taxi drivers are stopping by to go into the shop to lay down their, their bet, if you will, that gold is going up or it's going down. Theoretically, it's a financial regulated institution in China, so it's not illegal because it's under the auspices of, of financials. But what happens is these junket operators, they got the money. Banks aren't going to give people and taxi drivers the money to go in and start uh, playing the commodity game. But these junket operators, again, they're right there. Here's the money you can't pay me back the money, what else are we going to do in trade? What are you going to do for our organization? So the degree of, of shadow banking is, is far greater, I believe, than, than what's reported. The role of Hong Kong is, uh, is far more systemic, I believe, than people want to admit. And again, I'm not, I'm not casting too many stones here, but, but I'll just leave you with this one uh, last observation. You know, I think China unfairly gets a lot of criticism. I personally I'm a big fan of what I think President Xi is doing. I think he's actually trying to turn a corner. Whatever his motivations, whatever suspect, I think he's on the right track and I hope it works out. Because let me tell you something, you know, China did not give the world LIBOR rigging. It didn't give it Forex rigging. It didn't give it, uh, you know, creative Luxembourg tax structures. It didn't give it Bernie Madoff. It didn't give it Enron. It didn't give it WorldCom. It didn't give it CDOs and credit default swaps. But can you imagine if the Chinese ever learned those skills? What'll happen? <laughs> Anyways, thank you very much and happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks, Bill. I, I think we have some time to take some questions from the audience. So can you, you put up your hand and then we'll bring you the mic and identify yourselves and your affiliation. I saw Enid, my old colleague. Enid? That was brilliant, thanks. Um, a lot of um, people say that um, money is laundered through the art auction market as well. Um, can you make some quick comments on that? I'm sorry, you're saying that money is... Laundered through the art auction market. Oh, <laughs> that was actually one of the topics I was going to talk about. Um, it is not a coincidence that as, as wealth grew in China and as the need to, to get money out grew, um, all of a sudden these art auction, you know, these auction houses and art. I actually uh, had money laundered through an art gallery for me. Let me explain quickly what happened. 
this fellow uh, was a launderer for the Hells Angels. He had a precious metals and arts uh, store. I went in, gave him, you know, he says, look, I can take $100,000 from you. In this case, actually established case law in Canada for using government money on reverse stings. Uh, but anyways, gave him, uh, uh, he said, okay, give me $100,000. Why don't you buy this painting that I have in my, my shop? Uh, he charged me, by the way, 6% to launder my money. But I will then take that painting, and I'm going to go across to the uh, uh, BC Government Art Gallery, because I know the curator, and I'm going to donate it to him uh, and get a $200,000 tax receipt. Because, again, very subjective of what the valuation is on these things. So, and then what he's going to do when he gives me that $200,000 tax receipt, he's happy, he's got a piece of art, but I'm aware of a, of a pavement contracting company that is looking to, uh, for a tax loss. So I'm going to sell them this tax receipt for 50 cents on the dollar. So again, it's the taxpayer that gets screwed, right? And, uh, and again, the reason I bring that up is with art, with fine coins, fine wines, these are all subjective values. And it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Everybody thinks that cash is the only medium of exchange. Anything that's got value is a stored measure. And it's easy to, to manipulate the value. What, what some uh, more sophisticated guys have done, if there's an artist who's up and coming and they recognize him, and, and again, you know, it's what the market will bear, but I'll take your paintings and I have a contract with you, but if I own 10 of your 15 paintings that have been out there already, it's worth my while to go to an auction and jack the price up. You know, so all of a sudden it should only be worth 20,000, but hey, a new, a new sale just went for $100,000, especially if it's a wash trade, but the market sees that $100,000 value has now been given to that artist in his paintings. My portfolio has just gone up by that much more. And again, it's a little bit esoteric, but there are those you know, who have more money than brains. And if somebody paid 100000 for that, I'm willing to pay 120 You don't even have to give me 120 Just pay me 80 I've paid them 10000 for all the other ones. So there, there's so many varieties in, in which it can be done. But that's, that's uh, I believe, a huge uh, way it's being done through the auction houses and, um, and, and wine and, uh, and the like. That gentleman in the gray suit, give us your name, please. Your Thank you. Uh, I'm Peter Fellas from uh, Reuters Breaking Views. I just, you, I mean, you said earlier that um, uh, you didn't, that the, the Chinese government basically not taken, had taken a fairly relaxed view in terms of sort of prosecuting some of this stuff, um, except when it's sort of socially disruptive or, or a threat to social stability. But I wonder, we've had this ongoing corruption crackdown. Uh, we've heard about these vast sums of money that, that some of the sort of senior part officials and their families have accumulated. It's a fair bet that quite a bit of that has come out of the country, come through Hong Kong. I just wonder, how would you sort of handicap the risks for, for banks, law firms, professional services firms, etc., that the Chinese government will at some point start following the money and start asking who actually helped some of these people, these government officials, uh, get their money out? I, I, I think that's a very good question. I absolutely 100% believe that, uh, you know, again, 78, they didn't have any banks. They partnered up with all these banks institutions. A lot of that was to get a knowledge transfer, how things are done. Um, last year, just to answer your question, last year uh, I was asked to meet somebody who's very close to uh, senior state security. And, and part of it was to talk about money laundering, and that's when they said, Bill, hot flows of capital coming back in are a concern. But what he said to me was, look, Bill, if, for example, we wanted to find money you know, that officials have absconded with, would you be able to help us track it down? And I said, it all depends on you know, how much information you give me. I said, I wouldn't do it, it's not what I do anymore, but I know guys who do that, and, and you give them the tools. And they said, uh, I said, okay, but, uh, you know, what about, uh, I lost my train of thought for a sec. But with, uh, with them trying to track down the money, they also said, look, Bill, you have something that's unique, and that is, we know you, there's a long story why, why Chinese government officials know me, but they knew my professional life uh, before and background. But they said, Bill, you have informal relationships with police and intelligence services that will allow us to save a lot of time because informally, rather than go through treaty requests, which could take years to, to go through the process, we don't even know what we're going to find at the end of it. But to have informal channels and relationships that can tell us if we're moving in the right direction to go after money, to go after assets. And that's what we do in the West. I mean, we, we do that all the time with informal uh, relationships to get around the, the, the difficulty sometimes of the formal route. So will they go after it? Are they going after it 100%? And, and they, like I said, they reached out to me a year ago about you know, what ability I could uh, to assist them. And, and nothing's come of it, of course, but, um, 
but the will and the desire is going to be there to go after people. And I think they're going to hold uh, professional firms and banks uh, to account. And that's why it'll be very interesting what comes out of Switzerland with uh, how many uh, Chinese are, are, are holding their money there. Uh, this gent in the white shirt. Uh, hello, my name is Russ Harding. Um, can I just ask you again, you said you gave a date and uh, a maximum sentence for the money laundering laws in Hong Kong. Could you just tell us again what you said, please? Sure. Um, on the, my understanding with the with financial institutions, the maximum sentence for, for specific money laundering, I, I believe, is 14 years. But in the ordinance dealing with financial institutions who, who have been found guilty of aiding and abetting in, in money laundering, the maximum sentence is two years. Oh, that's not what you said before, of course. Now you've changed your story. And you said it came in in about 2012. When it yeah, the money laundering ordinance uh, came in in 2012, correct? No, it didn't, no. Okay, I, I the, was under the assumption it did. So it's, uh, you've got some great stories, but if you don't get your very basic facts right, it's very hard to believe, really, anything you say. Because there was original money laundering law ordinance came in for drugs in 1989. Then the full money laundering law ordinance came in. The Organized and Serious Crimes Ordinance came in in 1995. Um, you also said that you have to prove the link between organized crime, uh, between the crime and the, the money. Even if you read Jake van der Kamp in the South China Morning Post, you know that's not true. You also said that the Court of Appeals said that um, uh, you had to prove knowledge. Uh, the standard is reasonable grounds to believe as well. Um, I mean, if you are going to come here and talk about Hong Kong laws and Hong Kong money laundering, then if you want any credibility, please just check your facts first. Thanks. Well, I appreciate your comments. and. Uh you know, I, I, the knowledge I got from that came from uh, what I read and from talking to people in the industry, both lawyers and police officers. This gentleman there. I'm Leon Hill. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm Leon Hill here with Kroll, uh, based out of Hong Kong. And we have uh, among our clients a number of banks and financial institutions. and. You know, while we're pretty good at getting people out of trouble, we like to help them stay out of trouble, and that's that's our primary focus. And in light of the increasing attention to enforcement and regulation, especially extra jurisdictional enforcement and regulation, how do we help our banks and financial institutional clients stay out of trouble? Yeah, good question. I mean, I believe that there's been a lot of focus on on a rules-based and a risk-based governance model. You know. As long as we can, we can tick the box or show where, where we've taken uh, reasonable steps by ticking the box, uh, that's adequate for, for protecting the interests of financial institutions or corporations. What seems to be lacking is a, is a principle-based governance model. You know, principle-based meaning, are we following the spirit and the intent uh, of the law? And, and that's where there seems to be a, a bit of a breakdown because if, if, you're, if you're operating on the, on the principle where you ask your, your lawyers or your counsel, hey, uh, can you make sure, how, you know, this new legislation or law came in, how do, we, how do we get around it legally so we can, we again, tick the box and be in good standing and, and facilitate our business? That's a real problem. I mean, I, I've actually uh, developed a, a global random virtue testing program that's a, a quantifiable principle-based model, which is designed to ensure that, that you know, not, at, not so much at the management level, but at the board level, especially the head of audit and governance committees, you know, what are you doing to demonstrate that you're taking a principle-based approach to everything from money laundering to, to financial crime issues? Okay, uh, we have time for a couple more questions, anybody? Uh, that gentleman in the back room with his hand up. Sorry, I can't see me in the back here, but I wanted to ask you to comment on Macau, since that's received a lot of attention about uh, the crackdown there and the, the slowdown in, in flow of funds. Can we relate that to uh, what's going on in China? Well, the, you know, I, I've, I've got some uh, figures that were given to me by, uh, by a, a lawyer who specializes in money laundering. And there are interesting stats about, about Macau, and I think it, it helps put it into perspective. But 90% of the gamblers uh, in Macau are from China. 1% of players in Macau account for 30% of the annual gross gaming revenue. Um, you know, protecting the anonymity of the high rollers is, is the primary consideration, especially for the, the VIP rooms and, and, again, the junket operators. So credit extended to gamblers by junket or VIP operators is done without uh, any type of paper trail or creating the paper trail. 
The majority of high rollers from China and Macau are government officials and officials from state-owned enterprises. Only 25% of high rollers from China, or those who are deemed high rollers, uh, who gamble in Macau are non-government persons, meaning 75% of the high rollers are, are government officers or government officials or belong with SOEs. And you know, 93% of the high rollers from China are male and they lose on average $3.3 million gambling in Macau. So you can see again uh, the huge uh, volumes in the undercurrent. And again, with, with, these, uh, with these junket operators, I mean, I, again, why, the reason I say I think the numbers are a lot larger, you know, these guys, if they're operating in these VIP rooms, they got to give a cut of, uh, of the house or the VIG uh, to the casino, you know, as they're operating in their premises, these private rooms. But you think with everything else they're doing to defeat the currency controls in China that they're disclosing the size or the volumes of the monies that are actually uh, going through. And, and on that note, you know, one of the things that I believe is, is going to start occurring, especially as the Chinese economy uh, stalls and, and people, uh, businessmen and the like, are facing uh, you know, credit line issues and, and potential bankruptcy, is you're going to see uh, the same, uh, you know, the junket operator type scenarios or Macau, because in all these rooms you have video cameras, you know, they, there's a whole record. If I've already got a relationship with, with a junket operator and I'm a Chinese businessman and I know that I've got some, some big trouble ahead of me um, and I don't want to lose all my money through a bankruptcy proceeding or the like, I might go to Macau and lose 30, 40, 50 million dollars in advance of any uh, potential uh, bankruptcy proceedings that, that are ahead of me. I've already got a relationship with the junket operator and he's got it all on camera and videotape. When I've got to go to the bankruptcy court, hey, I lost 50, 60 million dollars gambling. Junket operator says, yep, here, that's what happened. He, was, he had a bad night of Baccarat. And, but again, they have the relationship. And later they can unwind that trade because there's a pre-existing relationship. You know, the operator will take his cut on it. But I think that you're going to see a lot more bankruptcy fraud and you're going to see a lot more uh, bankruptcy fraud being committed through uh, losing a lot of money in the casinos. Okay, anyone else? Uh, this gentleman here. Do you have an estimate of the size of money being laundered through Hong Kong? And of this, how much is uh, attributable to China sources? Um, I, I, I don't know what the, the raw number is. I, I, I believe uh, I read just the other day that something like $97 billion you know, in, in, in recognized cash flows uh, came in last month into to Hong Kong. But in terms of what the total numbers are, I can give you uh, you know, one, uh, one number. When I spoke with the fellow from state security last year, you know, he, he made the point that when the, uh, when the Hong Kong trade settlement came in uh, in 2010, the, the, you know, that allowed the more free trade of the renminbi as, as trade, the, the, the laundering rate, not necessarily through the parallel banking, but the laundering rate was as high as 10% uh, a number of years ago. And since 2010, it's dropped to as low as 2%. So just with the whole issue of, of supply and demand, you know, obviously, there's more flow getting out, uh, more more coming through, and and the cost of the transaction has has been dramatically reduced. So I would suggest that the amount of capital flows has actually been increasing and, and not decreasing. Okay, Marty, last question. <coughs> yeah, I'm Martin Mertz. Uh, I don't know that high officials are the place you need to look. Yesterday's post mentioned that the finance chief of Boyang County had a gambling kitty of three billion dollars in Macau. I just checked, Boyang has a population of one million. It's a county. There's 2,000 counties in China. So the numbers could be really big. Well, I, I don't think we have any, any measure. I mean, depending on, on who you speak with or who you read, you know, has China seen a trillion dollars or three trillion dollars pilfered out of its uh, out of its coffers over the last 20 years. I know that uh, you know, People's Bank put out a report uh, that between uh, you know, 2005 and I think 2013, something like 18,000 uh, government officials have simply fled China. And, and I think they're looking for a good number of them. So the scope and scale is truly of China proportions. Okay. So one very last question. Oh, okay, that gent had his hand up some time back beside the camera. 
Hi there, I'm Mike Forsyth from the New York Times. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, I was struck by what you said about BVI companies in Hong Kong. Um, you know, how much more is this place infected with BVI holdings than other <laughs> jurisdictions? And give us some tips for reporters whose hearts sink whenever we, the paper trail ends with a BVI. What are, what are some tricks to, to find out a little bit more about that, if any? Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if there's any tricks. To, I mean, the, 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 that global media consortium has done a great job, actually, of, of piercing uh, all those BVI, uh, you know, identities of who's behind the companies. But uh, again, I, I, you know, operating when I did in, in North America, you know, we just didn't see the, the same propensity and for the use of these, you know, offshore IBCs, international business corporations, which is all really a BVI is. But, but coming here, it seems like, uh, you know, every, every second person has a BVI. Uh, you know, you look in, on the shareholdings of a number of, of companies, and again, they do it for tax reasons. I get all that. There's a lot of legitimate reasons. But again, within legitimate reasons, you can hide a lot of Ill illegitimate uh, purposes, and it provides a degree of anonymity. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm aware that, you know, no, nobody likes a vacuum, but there's a number of South Pacific Island jurisdictions now that have incorporated, uh, as part of their constitution, corporate uh, secrecy acts and, and, and bank secrecy, because with the exposure of what happened in, in, with the BVI through the media, uh, they know that there's a market for other people who want to get uh, access to these sort of corporations that are legally protected. And, so there's, there's been a number of, of people that I know that, that have now been exploring some of these corporations in, in, in South Pacific. But the only way that you're, you're, you're going to get in behind a lot of that activity is to have somebody inside the BVI who's willing to uh, share information with you or, or be really adept at hacking, I suppose, which, which I don't uh, condone. But, but that's, that's the way a lot of people seem to be doing it nowadays. Okay, uh, that's it, but uh, folks, thanks a lot for coming, and uh, Bill, thanks once again. You're welcome back anytime, same time next year. Okay, thanks, Thank Wayne, you. I appreciate it.